Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we talk everything true crime. So if you have stumbled across this video and have never heard of this channel before, welcome. I hope you enjoy today's case coverage and you like the channel and consider supporting it by hitting that subscribe button below and coming back and checking out what I have to say and some of the cases that we cover. And if you are a returning subscriber and you already know what we do here, welcome back. I'm happy to have you guys here with me today. And we have got another case that we have all got to talk about because today we are going to be doing a deep dive on a case that many of you guys are familiar with and many of you guys have also been requesting. And it's the case of the Delphi murders. Now, because many of you guys may know, there have been several new pieces of evidence and information that has recently surfaced. And in my opinion, a lot of this new information that has come to light if you start really connecting the dots between a lot of it, it kind of is a no-brainer as to what happened to these two young best friends who were just tragically murdered. So today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through this entire case with a fine-tooth comb. We're going to review the latest pieces of evidence that have emerged, the transcripts, and I'm going to share with you actually what dots I connected that really lead me to believe what I think happened on that fateful day when they were just so brutally murdered. So gear up, get ready, and let's get into it. Tend to life with Annie Elise starts right now. Abby Williams and Libby German were two best friends living in Delphi, Indiana. Abby was 14 years old and Libby was 13 years old. And Abby was apparently an absolute animal lover. I am talking she loved everything outdoors. She loved all sorts of animals and just was, you know, one with nature. She lived with her mom full time and loved spending time with her grandparents as well. And Libby, Libby was described as just the sweetest and kindest little girl. She lived with her grandparents and with her sister, Kelsey, who she was extremely close with. And she was just a pretty happy-go-lucky little girl. So the two of them were best friends and they went to middle school together and really just had all of the same common interests. They were excited about the upcoming softball season. They were excited about playing the saxophone, which it's like, how hard is it to find somebody else who loves playing the saxophone at a young age like that? They loved photography, painting, really just everything. Any hobbies that one of them had, the other loved equally as much. So the two of them spent so much time together and they really were truly just the best of friends. Now, Delphi, Indiana, let's talk a little bit about that location. Delphi is a very small town in Indiana. It's less than three square miles in size and has less than 3,000 residents, according to a census that was done back in 2019. So a very, very tight-knit community. And that's where they loved. That's where they grew up and everybody was friendly with each other and it was just, you know, reportedly a great town to be a part of. But on February 12th, 2017, everything would just start to unravel and rock these two little girls' world and their families' lives. So on February 12th, the two little girls decided to have a sleepover at Libby's grandparents' house. The next day was actually going to be a school holiday from unused snow days, so they wanted to hang out, have a sleepover, and then spend the entire next day together. So they ended up spending that evening with Libby's older sister, Kelsey. They hung out with Kelsey, ate pizza, stayed up, and just had, you know, a typical girl's sleepover night. You're watching movies, you're talking about boys, you're, you know, messaging people, you're eating pizza, just like an innocent, happy sleepover. But they had absolutely no idea what the next day would bring. The next morning, they woke up and they enjoyed pancakes for breakfast, and they then just started their day. They helped Libby's grandma, Becky, actually with filing, some of her filing work because they wanted to make a little extra money, possibly go shopping later that day. So they did this, they helped with the filing, but then they decided that they wanted to head out and go enjoy the day outside. And they wanted to go to Monon High Bridge Trail. And this trail was essentially like the spot for teenagers to hang out at. We all had one. We already, we, everybody had one in high school and even in middle school. And here, everyone always wanted to hang out there, and it was really well known. It was an old abandoned railway bridge, and it had trails all along it. And it was just the spot that people would go to. We had one in my school called, what was it, The Log, and it was literally just 
a blank log in a wooded area, but that was the meetup spot. We would all go there. So Abby and Libby asked Grandma Becky if they could go, and Grandma Becky told them that they could go, but only if they could find rides to and from the trail. She did not want them walking on their own. So Libby asked her sister Kelsey if she would take them, and Kelsey initially had said no. She had afternoon plans with her boyfriend that later that day, but then she ended up having a little bit of guilt for not spending a ton of time with Libby. So she says, you know, I'll take you guys and I'll drop you off if you can find a ride home. So then Libby decided to call her dad, Derek, who happened to actually be taking photos of Grandma Becky later that day, and she asked him if he could pick them up. Her father, Derek, said that once he was done with Grandma Becky, he would pick them up and that it would be approximately, you know, two hours in total. So now Libby and Abby had their rides. They were going to head out to the trail and have a fun day out away from school. School was closed and they were just going to enjoy the outside. So they all piled into Kelsey's car around 1.30 p.m. and Kelsey drove them to the trail. On the way, Kelsey had received a phone call from her boyfriend while she was on her way to drop the girls off. So she takes the call around 1.38 p.m. and then she was still on the phone with her boyfriend around 1.40 p.m. when she dropped the girls off at the entrance to this trail. So she made sure that both girls had their jackets and Kelsey and Libby told each other that I love you because their family always made sure to voice their love for one another. And she stayed watching the girls enter the trail before then driving off. At 2.05 p.m., Libby posted a photo on her Snapchat story of the bridge. And then she posted another photo at 2.07 p.m., just two minutes later, of Abby walking on the bridge. And at some point, Libby began taking a video on her cell phone through her camera roll app, you know, the video app. And in the beginning of the video, they were talking about, you know, typical teenage stuff, just girl stuff. But then in the video, you can actually see a man walking with blue jeans and a jacket on and he's walking along the bridge but the angle of the video almost makes it seem like Libby took this video of the man behind her then you hear the guy say guys down the hill so who was this man it seems as though she was purposely videoing him was this something that she was doing for her own safety to like video him to make sure he was on film? Was she doing it out of fear? Why was she filming this man? And more importantly, who was he? And why was he telling them to go down the hill? And this was the last time that the girls were ever seen alive. At 3.11 p.m., about an hour and a half since they were dropped off at the trail, Libby's dad, Derek, called Libby's phone to let her know that he was getting close and he was gonna be there to pick her up but there was no answer on her phone. So he pulled into the parking lot at 3.14 p.m. and then he called her. Again, there was still no answer and the girls were also not at the meetup spot that they had originally agreed upon. So obviously her dad, Derek, is very concerned because what teenage girl is not answering her phone or her text messages, especially this day and age when teens are literally always on the phone. And we know that she was very active on her phone, on Snapchat, posting photos, taking videos, all of these things. So Libby wasn't the type of girl to just blow off family phone calls or texts either. So Derek decided he was going to walk these trails and see if he could find the girls because something felt wrong here. Derek passed a man who was in a flannel on the trails and asked him if he had seen the two girls. The guy said that he did not, but that he did see a couple up there. Now, this area was an intersection of the trail where the 505 and 501 trail meet. So when this man in the flannel shirt, whose name has never officially been released, said that he didn't see the girls, Derek decided to take one of those paths, the 505 trail, thinking that maybe they must have gotten on that one instead. But when he couldn't find them on that trail, he became much more concerned and knew that something was not right. He called Becky, Libby's grandmother, and asked her if she could try to get a hold of Libby. And Grandma Becky was actually with Libby's Aunt Tara at the time. So they began calling Libby, trying to get in touch with her, texting her, but they had no luck. They were completely unsuccessful. So then Derek, as he's continuing to search these trails, decides that he's going to check the Freedom Bridge Trail. And this was part of the area. But the girls weren't there either. And this was frightening. He was extremely nervous, and this is when the family started freaking out. Nobody was answering their phone calls. Nobody was answering their text messages. He couldn't find them anywhere. It's beginning to start to get dark. This is a problem, and they are panicking at this point. Where were these two young girls? Something had to be seriously wrong for them not to answer their phones and not to show up at the meeting spot. 
So Grandma Becky calls Libby's Grandpa Mike, who left work to come and see if he could help. And Grandma Becky also called Libby's sister Kelsey to let her know that they needed help searching for these girls. So Kelsey immediately leaves her boyfriend's house, who she had plans with that afternoon. She called into work and she went to help search. Everyone made their way over to these trails to go and search for these girls. Kelsey and her uncle Cody were paired together and they were searching the southeast end of the bridge. They were actually near a private property and spent about 20 to 30 minutes yelling the girl's name, just trying to search for them anywhere they could be. Kelsey also called Libby's phone thinking that if Libby was there, she would hear the phone since it was relatively quiet outside. And Grandma Becky spent her time calling AT&T to see if they could ping Libby's phone to see if there was a known location. But of course, cell phone companies get very, very finicky about this kind of stuff. And, you know, legally, they're not able to give you the ping until they have a formal request from the police. So this was unsuccessful. Grandma Becky even tried downloading certain apps like Find My Phone, things like that. But she realized that it wouldn't have worked because Libby didn't have those apps installed on her phone. So now hours have gone by, guys, and at 5.20 p.m., literally over two hours later, the family decides it's time to call the police and report the girls as missing. By 6 p.m., news had gotten around that small town, and people were obviously freaking out. It was a very small town, and how could these two girls just mysteriously vanish in such a small town where everyone seemingly knew everyone? And the big positive about living in such a small town was definitely the sense of community, because everybody rallied together and started volunteering and searching for these girls, trying to crowdsource information, trying to hit the trails, trying to do anything they could to figure out what had happened. After five, I called the police. Okay. We'd, went, we'd been searching as a family, couldn't find anything, uh, and thought, okay, it's going to start getting dark, let's get the police involved here. And they immediately came out in force, uh, started walking the trails with us, looking for, uh, looking for the girls. Um, and so by six o'clock, there's a, there, there's a search underway, right? You said a lot of people oh, yeah. came out? Yeah. Yeah, most of the town was out. People were out all over the streets of Delphi, flashlights, walking, just groups and, and hundreds, you know, hundreds of people seemed to be coming out uh, to help us look. People split up and went through each finger of that trail system. We don't, we don't know which direction he came from or but where with he an went. Out, within an hour and 23 minutes of her last Snapchat post, you were there yeah. looking around. Yes. Yeah. Okay, hour and 23 minutes. You're there looking around. You don't see anybody. You don't see the guy. And there, he just disappears. Well, actually, there was somebody there at 314. Um, Libby's dad was there to pick them up. At 314? At 314. He called them first at 311 and said, I'm almost there. Start heading back to the trailhead. And he got there at 314 and called them again and said, hey, I'm here. And she still didn't answer. So he started walking the trails. Okay, that's 41 minutes. Yes, and, at that time he and, started walking the trails. He called me at 330. So he had already been there for 16 minutes. And a couple of local news channels also started to pick up this case and talk about this to share as much information out there as possible. Up story tonight, two Carroll County girls have gone missing near the Monon High Bridge Trail in Delphi. News 18's Alexis Moberger joins us live and reports how several law enforcement agencies are looking for them. Alexis. Brittany, the two 13-year-old girls went missing hours ago and were told they haven't been answering their phones ever since. The Carroll County Sheriff's Office say the girls were last seen around 1 o'clock this afternoon near the Monon High Bridge Trail. Liberty or Libby German and Abigail Williams were dropped off by a family member. When she came back to pick them up around the arranged time, they never showed up. The sheriff's office was then notified around 5.30 tonight, and right now several deputies are out looking for the two girls and are even using drones to help locate them. We're also told that DNR is out by the water searching and trying to locate the girls as well. 
Police are asking for the public's help. If anyone knows anything about where they could be or where they were last seen, they are encouraged to contact the Carroll County Sheriff's Office. Police were paying so much attention to this investigation. They were not letting a minute slip by. They had Libby's grandpa Mike go back to his house and get every single electronic device from that house so that they could search it. They were also beginning to process that formal request for AT&T to ping the cell phones. So not only were volunteers and police on the ground searching, they had also pulled out drones, there were firefighters, there were even trained water personnel out there searching. But by midnight, it became way too dangerous to continue the search, given how dark it was and given how woodsy the area is. So law enforcement called off the official physical search of the girls with plans to resume the search the following day. And at this point, they had said that they did not suspect any sort of foul play because at that point, they really didn't have much to go off of. But still, this is so scary. You're now closing out the day. You're calling off the search. There's two young teens out there missing. Even if there isn't any sort of foul play to be suspected, you know something is wrong. And then to just, as a family member, try to go through the night or sleep that night, which you're obviously not sleeping, but knowing that nobody's out there searching, it's that has to be just extremely devastating. The police continued working on pinging the phones, but at some point, the phone had died, meaning that there were not going to be any sort of updated pings done or in the area or anywhere for that matter. And even though that official search was called off, it didn't stop the family, the volunteers, or the firefighters, and they all stayed and searched throughout the night. And that is, again, just a huge testament to the sense of community in this town. By Tuesday morning, every local news station was broadcasting about these two missing girls. This morning, our top story this morning happening right now in Carroll County. The sheriff's office and community members continue to look for two missing girls last seen near the Monon High Bridge Trail in Delphi. News 18's Alexis Moberger reports how many have spent hours searching, and they say they will not stop looking until the girls are found. We're just praying for their safe return. 13 year olds Liberty German and Abigail Williams went missing Monday. The girls were last seen near an abandoned railroad bridge known as the Monon High Bridge around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. A little upset, confused, obviously very distraught, just worried. All I want to do is have the girls get home safe. The girls were dropped off near the bridge to walk around and hang out. They had made arrangements to be picked up by a family member later in the afternoon. But when it came time for the girls to be picked up, they never showed up. Getting scared now. Abigail's mom, Anna Williams, has spent hours worrying, just hoping to hear her little girl is okay. It's getting cold. It's been out a long time. They don't know what time they ate last. The girls haven't answered their phone since around the time they went missing. Missing, abducted, we don't know for sure. Uh, cell phone has been pinging around town here. There's a cell phone tower, but the ping was last noted about five or six hours ago. They say the phone's now dead. The last Snapchat from one of the girls was from 207. Text, I saw a text where they got delivered, but they never got read. Very scary situation right now. and. I just, I just want her home. Now many are on an extensive search to find them. Ravines, ditches, trash cans for phones, any, any sign of, of it, the girls and anything we can find to just find them. Deputies, firefighters, and local police are checking every crevice and nook. Looking for answers, looking for the girls. But so are others from the community. And many of them say they won't stop looking, even if it takes. Daybreak, fall over with exhaustion. Honestly, I hope they're just hidden up somewhere, scared to be in trouble. That morning, the search was called back on, and more and more volunteers were showing up and helping with the search efforts. They were being split up into search groups, and then they had a meeting at a command center that was set up to where everybody would go and then get distributed and then come back and report back information. Well, at around 12.15 p.m., footsteps led searchers to a horrible discovery, and it was the discovery of the bodies of Abby and Libby. A volunteer searcher had found a shoe of Libby's, and when he looked up, there were actually two deer in the grass. As he got closer, he saw the two girls laying in between the trees in the woods. 
The girls were found on a private property near the high bridge, and they were about 50 feet from the shore of Deer Creek, which wasn't far from where Abby and Libby had actually initially been dropped off. But it was also somewhere that they would not have wandered off and gone on their own. And Sister Kelsey remembers the moments that they were found, and she was asked if she saw their bodies. And Kelsey says, at that point, I had not, but I wanted to. I wanted to go and to run towards them, but the girl that was with me in my group held me down and told me that we don't know who it is yet. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they look like. We don't know. We don't know anything that's happening, and we don't know what's going on, so right now you can't go to them. And so apparently this girl just kind of held Kelsey there, making sure that she stayed there so that she wouldn't go towards this horrible scene of the crime, which I would, I don't know, looking back, I would think that that probably was a blessing in disguise, that Kelsey didn't have to see her sister and her sister's friend like this. By 2 p.m., law enforcement had a press conference stating that they did in fact find two bodies, but they did not confirm that it was Abby and Libby. And from there, the FBI immediately got involved. I'm Riley. I'm with the Indiana State Police. I'm the public information officer for the Lafayette Post. Steve Mullen, Delphi Police Department, Chief of Police. Topolize. I'm the Carroll County Sheriff. Basically, we're going to make this, it's going to be short and sweet. We don't have that much at this point in time. Uh, basically, what we've got, uh, we have found uh, two bodies. Um, is that the Sugar Creek? Deer Creek. Deer, Deer Creek, Creek, sorry. In Deer Creek, uh, about a mile east of town. Um, we are investigating this as, as a uh, crime scene. Uh, we suspect foul play. Uh, we have not made positive identification of the two bodies, so we're not going to be releasing any information on them at this point in time. Uh, we've got uh, the Indiana State Police is assisting the Carroll County Sheriff's Department and the uh, Delphi City Police Department in the investigation here. We also have the FBI Crime Scene Investigation Group here out of Indianapolis. And uh, one thing the family asked us to do is to thank all the communities around Delphi and the people here in Delphi for assisting in attempting to locate these, uh, the two young children that were missing earlier. Uh, they just wanted to say thank you to those people and thank you. Uh, it, they were just wanted to, to express their, their gratitude toward the hard work that was done uh, in helping uh, search for these children. Is the, is, has the search been called off for these two teenagers? Not officially because we have not positively identified the bodies at this point in time. Do you have people still searching the woods and creeks and fields? We still have, there's still people out looking, uh, but the, it has been scaled back. I mean, just put it that way. Are the bodies of the two individuals recovered are those of young female children? I'm not at, at liberty to give that information out as, as of this time. Who found them? I'm not going to say at this point in time. Why do you believe that there is foul play? Uh, just the way the bodies were found. That's about all I can say at this point in time. Were they in the water? They were on the edge of the water from what I understand. That's about the best I can tell you. Autopsies began on February 15th in Indiana, and a positive identification was made on both girls, and then the search was officially over. From there, this now turned into a double homicide investigation. On February 22nd, a press conference was held about the murders, and law enforcement pleaded with the public to come forward with any information that they had. They assured the public that the investigation was just getting started, so that they needed to be patient and that they would absolutely not give up and they would find whoever was responsible for these two deaths. They also released the audio clip to the public during this press conference. They said that it was not all that was found on Libby's phone, but that they were remaining tight-lipped about everything else that they had found as to not jeopardize the investigation. Soon after, people learned that DNA was also recovered from the bodies and the scene of the crime, and it was being fast-tracked to the lab. So a couple of months later, on April 22, 2017, another press conference was held. Investigators continued to remain tight-lipped over everything, but in July of 2017, they ended up releasing a sketch of who they believed to be the suspect. Tips continued to come in, but no real leads were generated. And in December of 2017, the girls' families and the police superintendent went on the Dr. Phil show. 
the superintendent spoke out about the guy who was on the bridge who was caught in that video and photo from Snapchat. Superintendent Douglas Carter is here from the Indiana State Police. And um, when this happened and these girls went missing, um, law enforcement really sprung into action here and, and started searching for these girls immediately, correct? They did. And um, when you look at the area around there, um, What's the most likely way for this person to have gotten away? Would he have gotten away by car, by foot? What's the most likely way for him to have gotten away? And Dr. Phil, right now, it'd be speculative of us to try and figure out how he got there or where he went after this occurred. But I certainly hope in my lifetime I can look him in the eyes and ask him that same question. You know, sometime between 207, when that last Snapchat post was put up, um, and by the time uh, family members started showing up and everybody started showing up. There's a window in there uh, between probably around 2.30 and 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, somewhere in there. This man had to be making his departure and, and hopefully somebody think about that. Think about that time on, on February 13th, 2017, between 2.30 and 4 o'clock-ish, uh, if you're anywhere in that vicinity, if you saw anything, anything, anything on foot, in a car, whatever, uh, you want to know it, right? I so appreciate you saying that that way because that is actually what happened afterwards. We started to canvas um, the city of Delphi and the areas on the same day that the, that the crime occurred. And um, we stopped cars and asked them, and, and please tell us if you saw anything suspicious, anything at all. But please remember, this is not unlike any other rural community anywhere in America. It's not a typical uh, a trailhead where there's a big, great big parking area where people come and go from a central place. It's accessible from multiple areas, multiple places in a very rural area. Yeah. So it does set it apart. It makes it a little bit different. Yeah. Now, I, I grew up in small towns. I mean, like <clears throat> y'all are living in. And if somebody showed up that didn't belong, he stuck out like a sore thumb because you knew everybody and everybody, everybody knew. And then if some transient showed up, they just stuck out like a sore thumb. Did anybody in town see this person before in the week leading up to or any time? We believe that the, that the sketch that you see behind you um, was a face-to-face -face encounter with a citizen of Delphi. Okay. So you, you think that's that that actually somebody uh, interacted with him, talked to him, saw him in a store, street, something, somewhere, somehow? We do. The person we believe to be the killer on the high bridge um, has been enhanced as best it, as it can be enhanced. That's him. What I believe is there's somebody that knows who that person is even though they can't see their face. I think I could identify a family member if I, if I couldn't see their face based upon the way they were standing, the way <clears> his <throat> hands are in his pocket, the untucked shirt, the, the gate, whatever that might be. And that's who we're looking for today. Mm -hmm. What is the theory about what is in the pocket here, Superintendent? What do you, what do you suppose? It, it would be speculative uh, and subjective at best. There's no way for us to be able to tell. It does appear that there's a shirt tail out though, doesn't it? And there's, a, there's speculation about what that might be, even, even, even with that. But um, somebody knows who this, this person is that caused such evil in a wonderful place. On February 13th, 2018, it marked a year since the death of Abby and Libby. And at the year mark, Libby's mom actually spoke on camera for the first time about her daughter and the effects that her murder has had on her. She sent me, it was, you know, a, a good morning, beautiful, have a good day, Snapchat. And I was on my way to work um, and I got one back and she's laying in the bed. And I was like, what are you doing in the bed? Well, I don't have school today. Lucky, you know, that was, that was our last conversation. Carrie, at a loss for what to do in the early days, bought a bulb. I, I never imagined it would go viral like it did. An orange one, which is now her porch light, leading others by the thousands to do the same. I feel like Libby sees it and it makes me happy. The bulbs will remain lit until an arrest is made. I worry about this happening to somebody else. 
I wonder, I worry about him getting somebody else's child and destroying another family. Please don't let that happen. On occasion, she finds herself calling Libby's cell phone, no longer in service. When it was, Libby's voicemail message was comforting. Carrie is proud that her daughter managed to record two key pieces of evidence with her cell phone, the audio, and a picture of the prime suspect. What a presence of mind for your daughter in particular on that day to take that picture. She's pretty smart. She's, she was called a hero. Yes, she's always been my hero. Libby and her other daughter, Kelsey, are always in sight. Their pictures adorn her walls. Carrie also spent 20 hours to get this artwork on her left arm. It includes Libby's favorite phrase, in a minute, and this I love you message she wrote in a Mother's Day card. Um, and we put it on a post-it because she puts everything on post-its. As well as the GPS coordinates to her burial site, which we won't show. That's a special place, which can get loud when Carrie pumps up the volume to the Guns N' Roses song, Sweet Child O' Mine, at the cemetery. Uh, my doors, I open my doors, I turn it up really loud. I really, I do. So you're that person. I am. You're that person. I am that person. <laughs> she could turn anybody's frown upside down. Anytime, anyway. She was always joking. She could make anybody's bad day better within minutes. So the world got shortchanged. I did. I know our family did, the girls' sisters did, the cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody did. For over a year and a half, the sketch, for over a year and a half after that sketch was released, investigators combed through thousands of tips, but nothing generated. And on April 22nd, 2019, over a year and a half later, in a press conference, re investigators replaced the original sketch. And this was a brand new sketch, but who was this person in this brand new sketch who looked entirely different from the person in the first sketch? It caused a lot of controversy and people were of course very, very upset by this. And they were very confused wondering how something like this could have happened. How the first sketch could look so much like one person and now it's being replaced with this new sketch who looks like somebody completely different. Had they been looking for the wrong person this entire time? The police also told the public to let them know if they saw a car parked out front of an old CPS building. Although they never gave a description of the car that they were looking for, they only had said that it had been parked out front of that building somewhere between the hours of 12 and 5 o'clock that day. Still, tips coming in, no real leads generated. However, in December of 2021, just a couple of months ago, a shocking discovery came to light. A plea came out for anyone with information about an online account by the name of Anthony Schatz to come forward. Apparently, in August of 2020, a man named Keegan Klein was charged with 30 counts, offensive, disgusting, graphic material. He had 30 charges, including possession of material. Um, including charges of obstructing justice. But there was something far worse about this to be discovered. Keegan's house apparently had been raided just a few days after the murders of Abby and Libby. And the probable cause to search his home was actually based on information that was developed by FBI cybercrime investigators. Keegan apparently made many fake personas online. He would then use those personas to solicit things from young women and young girls and even schedule meetups. But it's also believed that other people, aside from just Keegan, had access to those accounts, including Keegan's father. And one of the young girls that was contacted through those accounts happened to be Libby. And this account was sending Libby messages up until just hours before her murder. A pretty big coincidence and the first actual real link of anybody to these murders. And it's no surprise that the account that Keegan was using to talk to Libby went by that name of Anthony Schatz. And Libby, as she was communicating with this account, was under the impression that Anthony was this young, rich model who liked to drive exotic and luxury cars and was just like, you know, a unicorn of sorts. And Libby was absolutely enthralled by this Anthony Schatz character. 
They were chatting for multiple days up until the murder. And I want you to remember that for multiple days up until the murder, because we are going to come back and circle back to this. Libby initially became aware of this account actually too from a friend of hers. Apparently they were having a sleepover party when Libby had first heard about this account and first started talking to this person. However, it was all wiped from Libby's phone, which was really odd. Who had wiped it off of her phone? So this other girl, this friend of Libby's, who gave Libby the information about this guy, had siblings who apparently had gone to school with Keegan at one point. And Keegan, apparently, had even stayed at their house when he was younger. So a few days after the murder, this girl, this friend of Libby's, gave this Anthony Schatz guy, as she was talking to him, her address, saying that he should come over since her parents were at work. After getting off the bus from school, she saw somebody who is believed to have been either Keegan or Keegan's dad looking in her house through the windows and wearing a mask. So this girl called her parents and the police, of course, then were called too. So obviously this Anthony Schatz guy was in no way who this little girl thought he was. She was being catfished by some disgusting creep. And this mask incident is what started the investigation into the Anthony Schatz account and then led them to Keegan's house. So after they raided Keegan's house, just a short time after the murder, Keegan actually also took a polygraph test, which included questions about knowing or having any contact with Libby German. He failed that polygraph test, guys. He also reportedly deleted his entire search history on his phone from dates of February 10th to February 15th, which is the window of time in which the first conversations began with Libby and exceeded over to after the murders. So he deleted the entire search history from the window of time of from when the conversations with that account first started talking to Libby in the days, remember I said the days before the murder, and then even from the days after the murder. However, we do get a glimpse into what his searches were, and we're going to get to that in just one minute. Keegan also gave DNA samples and he had an interview. And in this interview, he did admit that he had an issue with that scan saying that the girls that he often talked to and material that he saved, he would, you know, get gratification off these things that were being sent to him. So Keegan was interviewed again after his arrest in 2020. And in that interview, he denied knowing Libby, but then he would acknowledge knowing her, but then he would deny it again. He also said that he wasn't this Anthony Schatz character, but then he would say that he did create Anthony Schatz and that he wasn't Keegan Klein. It's weird. It's almost as though he's like slipping in and out of this internet persona, like it is him, that it isn't, that it's the reality. It's, it's very, very bizarre. And the whole thing is just beyond creepy. Keegan said that he had talked to actually hundreds of girls and so that he didn't remember if he ever had actually talked to Libby and he couldn't remember anything about her. But there's no way that you just don't remember a young girl that you're talking to who then was literally murdered as you were talking to them, especially when we get to his search history. He then also in this interview acknowledged that Libby apparently at one point had annoyed him, so he ended up blocking her. However, police found evidence of a meetup with Libby being planned by whoever had access and was running this account, whether it was Keegan or not, or his father or not, is up in the air. But someone sent a message to Libby scheduling this meetup at the bridge. The meetup was allegedly supposed to be the day of the murder, but Libby apparently never showed up. Or could it be that she showed up and something happened for whoever set that up? Keegan and his dad were in Vegas shortly after the murders happened, but they were not in Vegas when the murders actually did happen. During an interview with law enforcement, the detective elaborated on some of the very odd phone searches that Keegan made after the deaths of Abby and Libby while he was in Vegas with his father and after the raid. So some of these searches included foul play suspected, searches about how long DNA lasts on someone, and even more searches. And these are kind of odd things to search when a double homicide is being investigated and just took place. And also, why would anybody randomly search how long DNA lasts on someone unless they were truly curious because they, I, I don't know, maybe had left DNA on someone? However, Keegan did have his DNA taken. So if the DNA on their bodies were tested and it came back with any sort of answer, Maybe it didn't come back as Keegan's DNA since he had given it, and maybe it was somebody else. Could it have been his father's 
DNA perhaps, DNA that the police did not have access to and were unable to run against the DNA collected on the girls. Many other people, aside from just me, are also concerned about Keegan's dad. His dad goes by the name Tony and has his own history of violence. And I would also just like to point out that Tony is short for Anthony, the name that had been catfishing online. And there's another little link we're gonna get to in a second too. So there's an event that had taken place years and years ago, and Keegan didn't seem to be aware of this event. But in this interview that Keegan had with police, a detective described an event and asked for Keegan's opinion on it. The detective said that they had a case a while back where this guy had a little kid and this little kid was in the bathroom and had overflown the toilet. So the little kid yells for help and the dad ends up coming at the kid, super pissed off, and so the mom intervenes. The dad ends up punching the mother and then she runs away. So the dad chases her down, hits her, bites her in the stomach, runs back inside, then slams the kid's head into the toilet, fracturing his orbital socket, then puts him upside down and starts dunking his head in the toilet that had overflowed. So Keegan is responding to the story that the detective is telling him, and he says, Jesus Christ, like what? And like a shot, like I'm sure you guys are thinking right now. And the detective responded, So what would you think of that guy? What would you think of that dad? And Keegan said that he should be hung and should be killed. They also asked Keegan what he thought that that person may be capable of. And Keegan says, probably anything. And then he says that he thinks that the man should die because he attempted murder on a kid. Well, in an interesting turn of events, a podcast that is actually run by an Indiana attorney and professional journalist confirmed that this story was actually about his father, Tony, and the child in this event was Keegan's stepbrother. Keegan's stepbrother also confirmed that he was this boy in this story, which is just crazy because it's like this event was horrible that this detective described, but Keegan's response to it as though he didn't know about the event and how horrified he was about the event. Did he know that that really was his father? It's it's weird, but it's something worth talking about. There was also another event confirmed, and in this event, it confirmed that Tony and a friend had followed an 11-year-old girl. Keegan's half-sister, which is also Tony's stepdaughter, has discussed a couple of incidents, actually two, when she was a child. And in one of these incidents, apparently he had told her to run and that he was going to shoot her with a BB gun. She said, no, you're not, no, you're not, thinking he was joking. And he, saw, and he told her to start running and that he was giving her a five-second head start. So when she started running, he shot her in the elbow. The BB lodged into her bone and she had to have surgery. She was also very scared of loud noises as a child. So apparently Tony would rev his dirt bike just to scare her. And one time he again told her to run as he was revving it. So she ran to a tree, climbed up it, trying to protect herself and get away. But then she fell out of the tree and broke her leg. Now, the odd thing about this is in both scenarios, he told her to run, almost as if it seems like he likes to hunt his victims a little bit. She also reportedly was forced to take his shoes and socks off every single day after work and put his socks on for him every morning. Just insanely weird and very, very gross. So all of that to say, could the bridge guy that was in this image and video or video have actually been Tony or Keegan? someone created a brilliant side-by-side comparison of the sketches that were released by law enforcement and compared them to Keegan and Tony. And the sketches are dead on and in my opinion, look identical. Could that be a coincidence or is this related to the case? Kelsey, Libby's sister, discussed in an interview that this new information about this Anthony Schatz account and this character does give them hope. It definitely gives me a renewed sense of hope. That announcement from police, the plea for information about this social media profile, it's what Libby German's sister calls the first potential lead in two years. It's a very good feeling knowing that they're still working on it and they do have new information and new leads that they're working on. While investigating the murders, detectives say they uncovered an online profile named Anthony Schatz. They say the person behind it was communicating with girls, their addresses, and try to meet them. Detectives just published a plea for help about it on YouTube. Detectives are seeking information 
about the person who created the Anthony Schatz profile. Today, 13 News obtained these court documents that show a man using that same profile name arrested last year in neighboring Miami County. Detectives in that case say Keegan Klein admitted to using the social media profile Anthony Schatz. The documents mention nothing about the Delphi case, and state police wouldn't say how Anthony Schatz might fit into their investigation. They are all questions Kelsey German would like answered as the painful search for justice continues five years later. It just feels like a new wave of grief is hitting me really hard in that you have to stay hopeful and remember that it's all going to happen in God's timing and to stay hopeful that justice will come no matter what. The police have not named Keegan or his father, Tony, as suspects thus far, but things really just don't add up, guys. And I also do think it's interesting that this fake account, this fake Anthony Schatz guy, Anthony is short for Tony, and Tony often threatened people and threatened violence with a gun, like Schatz. So, it's An so Anthony Schatz just seems like a really interesting name to use online to catfish to me, honestly. We also know that Keegan had failed the polygraph test where he was asked if he had any knowledge or information about the girls or the murders. He also had deleted that entire search history of on his phone from February 10th to February 15th, which is the window of time in which the conversations first began with Libby and the time of the murders. Keegan also apparently admitted to police that when he told his father that he was being questioned in relation to the murder case, his father started freaking out. Why? Could Tony have been the one to have murdered the girls? Could Keegan have been an accomplice? Or vice versa? Is Keegan possibly taking all of the blame for scan material that police found in an effort to make him the center of attention so that his dad isn't looked into further? And could it be that once he serves his time for all of this material that he and his father are essentially off the hook and they can go back? Or is this all just an odd coincidence and someone else out there is responsible for the murders of these two innocent girls? Because the investigation has been going on now for five years and not a single arrest has been made. Not one. No cause of death has ever been released, and investigators also still remain tight-lipped about most details regarding this case. I believe, it's my personal belief, that the father is involved somehow. That is my belief. I don't know if Keegan is covering for him. I don't know if it's something where he has been so brainwashed. I don't know. Like, I, I have a lot of theories kind of floating on in my head, but I would love to hear what your theories are and leave them in the comments below because I want to know what you guys think happened and I want to know who you think is responsible. I believe that whoever was using this account set up that meeting with the girls that day and that's when they went to the bridge. I think that the person they got on film that day is either Keegan or Tony. I'm leaning towards Tony. I think that the reason he, that person was instructing them to go down the hill was because, again, there is that, you know, past pattern of liking to hunt, so to speak, and trying to force them in a direction to where then you follow. And I think that that's why the search, I think there's too many coincidences. I say it all the time, guys, where there is smoke, there is typically fire. And the amount of coincidences between this account of theirs talking to these girls just hours before the, the murders, the fact that they deleted the search history, the fact they searched how long DNA lasts on someone, the fact that the father got pissed off when, and got really frantic when he learned that they were asking questions, it doesn't align. It all, to me at least, points in the direction of there was some sort of involvement here from these two men. And again, something just deeply rooted in me believes it's the father and that Anthony is more of, I don't want to say the enabler, but maybe the person who helps it get to come to fruition and then helps cover for his father. Maybe they work in a pair. I think his dad is the one pulling the strings, but I could be wrong. And that's why I want to know what you guys think. So leave your comments, your theories, and any other details you know about this case that are proven to be fact, leave them in the comments below. Hopefully we get some justice in this case for these two young girls and for their family and answers begin to surface. I'm hopeful now with Keegan in custody that if there is any sort of you know, bond to his father or loyalty to his father. Hopefully as time, you know, continues to go on while he's in custody, hopefully that will start to wear and it'll go away to where he'll start sharing and speaking up and being more forthcoming. 
I don't think that he would flip necessarily, but maybe like, you know, if there is some element of loyalty or brainwashing, hopefully over time that will begin to disintegrate. So then he will slip up or share information or something. But until then, we just have to keep hoping that people have who have information or had any sightings, that this information will help the investigation and that these, you know, two beautiful little girls killer will be brought to justice and the truth will come to light. So share this where you can. It spreads awareness. It spreads more information so that hopefully we get those answers. Thanks again for tuning in today with me, guys. I hope you enjoyed the case coverage and the video. Don't forget, if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button. It's totally, totally free, and it's an easy way to support the channel, and it will notify you of new case videos as they come. Thanks again, guys, and until the next case, stay safe. Bye.